Welcome everybody, my name is Mina Jane and I am the director of the Ashland Public Library. I'm so thrilled to be here with Kate Bateman who I've sort of been in touch with for a couple of years now and I'm just completely impressed with her, like all the stuff that she does. Um, but before we get to Kate, I just wanna say a couple of things. One is that um, we are, you can buy signed books from Kate from Bank Square Books. Uh, as some of you might know, I think that signed books are gold. They're great gifts, they're great to keep because I hold on to mine. So um, I will put a link for that in the chat. And um, I'd like to thank the Friends of the Ashland Library who support all of our programs. We could not do this stuff without them. And um, I'd like to say that uh, Kate is going to do a presentation, as you can see on the screen. And um, at the end, she'll take questions, which I will moderate. So feel free to put questions into the Q&A whenever you think of them. And if you want to add anything to the chat about where you're coming from or how much you love this, feel free. I will be paying attention to that as well. So I am just gonna do a quick introduction for Kate. She is um, a best-selling author of Regency and Renaissance historical romances, but she's also the owner of a, um, an antiques auction house. So she is like, for me, like the best of all worlds. She knows her history and she writes about it. So today she's gonna be talking about story versus history. And the one thing I found really interesting, Kate, on your uh, website was that you're your husband owes you a dollar. Can you talk about that a little bit and then before you get into your presentation? He does. Well, actually, on my website, it says a dollar. It's actually a pound because this bet happened years ago in England. So I changed it for some artistic license to a dollar. But um, yeah, I had wrote my first historical romance as a, a bet because I had read one and threw it across the room and it was terrible. And I wish I could remember which it was. It's probably good I can't, but I said, I've, I've just wasted, you know, eight dollars of my, or eight pounds of my good money on this terrible book and I could write better. And my husband said, yes, but I bet you a pound you won't. And at that point, my competitive edge kicked in and I went, I bet you a pound I can. And so <laughs> I, I did just to see if I could do it. And that actually turned into my very first romance manuscript, which ironically then went on to get nominated for a reader, which is hilarious. But um, yeah, that's how it started. That's just, I just wanted to see if I could actually finish an 80,000 word manuscript. And um, I wrote what I wanted to read, which at the time was Italian medieval Renaissance kind of stuff. Um, so that's how it happened. So yeah, he does still owe me a dollar. I should get all pound. I should get him to, you know, stick it to the wall if he ever gives it to me. <laughs> well, we are recording this, so it's official. <laughs> yes. A dollar would be better because I could tape it to the wall and make him sign it and frame it, whereas a pound is just a pound coin now. So I'm going to stick with the dollar. They're about the same inflation wise at the moment. So I'll, I'll take the dollar. Sounds awesome. So I'm going to go off screen and have at it. Have at it. OK, well, hello, everybody. Um, thank you so much for coming. I don't know who's out there in the ether. I can't see any of you. So I'm just going to talk to myself for the next hour or so. Um, welcome to Story versus History. Hopefully you can all see my screen because I'm going to click through this quite quickly. Um, as Mina said, I am a historical romance author. Um, I'm traditionally published by St. Martin's Press and Random House. And um, my first book, uh, which we just talked about, that, that one dollar book was called uh, The Renaissance Robert's The Devil to Pay and it was ended up being nominated for a Reed Award. Um, here was me at, a couple of weeks ago at a book signing. Um, and here are some of my books. Uh, that's a couple of different series I've got here. The um, Bow Street Bachelors series. I've got uh, the new series is Ruthless Rivals. I've got um, Secrets and Spies and a couple of others in there too. And my books have been translated into multiple languages. So there's some really cool covers here. You can see this, the uh, Japanese one, I think there. There's some uh, Romanian or Croatian. I'm a bit, a bit bad on that. German, French, uh, all sorts of stuff here. But as I said, in my first life, before I came to America and started writing romance, I was an auctioneer valuer. I founded my own auction house in the UK in 2001 uh, alongside my father. And because of that, I ended up being um, sort of headhunted to be one of the on-screen presenters uh, and sort of valuers for a couple of TV shows that we have in the UK. So a bit like your Antiques Roadshow, uh, there's one called Bargain Hunt, there's me on that one, there's uh, one called Flog It, um, Put Your Money Where Your Mouth Is. And... Um, that, there's Batemans of Stamford, that's my auction house. It's been going 20 years now. I passed the, uh, passed the book on to my, one of my brothers who now runs it, Greg. And we have sold, I think, about 50 million pounds worth of items over the last 20 years or so, which is pretty cool. Um, so I've obviously seen hundreds of thousands of historical items. And I've 
written about a few of them and we're going to talk about that today. So who is me? What are we doing here and why are we here? Well, today I really want to go quickly through what are stories and why do humans need them? What's the difference between story and history? Uh, how can stories add value and how do fiction writers like me use real historical facts in our books? This is going to be a whistle stop, whistle stop tour through history so hang with me we're going to go right back to the fact that humans on a really basic level need stories. Um, narrative storytelling is a core feature of being human and from an evolutionary kind of anthropological point of view it's the reason we've been so successful as a species because we can communicate key information um, before we could write we obviously had spoken so oral history and visual stories like this one here on the screen the caves at Lascaux that 17,000 year old story and we can clearly see that something's going on here it's helping somebody make sense of the world it's telling them some information it's not quite clear what it's saying there's a bison there's some maybe an arrow there's a man who possibly is dead there's a bird but clearly it's telling us something you know maybe that the guy who goes near a bison and tries to kill it ends up dead so stories are key to human brains and they work for humans because there are very few other animals that can empathize um, they think a few other people or a few other animals like elephants and things like that can empathize but basically it we have the ability to imagine ourselves in the place of another and that's really important because it we're not limited by our own experiences we can then imagine someone else's experiences and benefit from those without the risk so stories are knowledge risk-free it means we can explore moral and physical dangers without having to you know get injured or killed ourselves and keep repeating these mistakes because somebody can tell us about it and say stay away from the saber-toothed tiger we also have a really cool bonus, which is the ability to understand concepts of an imagined universe. So we're not bound by physically what's in this universe. We can imagine things that don't exist in real life. So we can imagine, like here, Jurassic Park, dinosaurs, a world with dinosaurs in it and humans at the same time. We can imagine planet-sized spaceships and, you know, things like that in Star Wars. So after we had that sort of oral tradition and the writing of the cave walls, stories turned from just physical survival information into social survival. We became more social as a group and they turned into handy guides on how to live well in a social group with others. So this is one of the very first written stories. I don't think you see my point here. Um, this is the Epic of Gilgamesh. It's written in Sumerian cuneiform and it's about 4,000 years old. And it's pretty cool. The actual legend to tell us about uh, a king who was Gilgamesh and it's basically a bromance between him and his best friend Enkidu who is a sort of half man half deity creature um, but it basically gives us a universal truth which is that even a king has to learn to be humble has to take advice has to go through a journey of discovery and you know things happen to him and he has adventures and comes to the to the conclusion that he has to be humble he has to accept advice which is the point of stories it's telling us universal truths and this brings us on to fairy tales because that those kind of epic poems and stories turned into what we now see as fairy tales which are the same things they're using this narrative framework to explore universal themes so little red riding hood here's a classic um basic safety tips watch out for wild animals listen to your parents don't disobey the rules obviously as well a kind of sneaky way of reinforcing whatever structures of society like patriarchal society um, were around at the time, you know, wait for the big strong woodcutter to come and rescue you, you know, don't do it yourself. And these are pretty old as well. So we know that Jack and the Beanstalk comes from a group of stories that are about 5,000 years old. Beauty and the Beast and Rumpelstiltskin are about 4,000 years old. And uh, the kind of Faustian bargain idea, this Smith and the Devil about somebody making a bargain with the devil and getting something in return is also Bronze Age. It's about 6,000 years old. So stories clearly impart really important information to us and we love it. We, we want the same things over and over again and we never tire of them, which is great for somebody like me as an author because there are no new stories. Um, people really haven't changed much in about 6,000 years. And we know this, there's a great uh, amount of information from Pompeii, which uh, is a very small place in Italy when uh, there was a, a volcanic eruption in AD 79, uh, Vesuvius erupted and basically covered the entire 
city of Herculaneum and Pompeii in ash, which basically preserved it in that moment. And when it was rediscovered in the 1880s, they found the entire place covered in graffiti. And it shows us that the goals, motivations, conflicts are exactly the same as people today. We're preoccupied with the same things. It's about relationships, desires, you know, feuds, love, hate, revenge, politics, art, crime. Um, this picture here is a political slogan. It's literally like, you know, your, your political uh, advert on the TV that you see now saying, you know, vote for me, I will clean up the streets or whatever it is. Um, so they're the same. So what we're going to do is look at some of these universal truths. One of my favourite from the walls of Pompeii is a classic, I hate my boss. Dominus es non gratis redentum, which is literally the boss isn't worth a rat's ass. Now, that is a sentiment, I think, that even now in the 21st century that most people can, can relate to at some point in their lives. So we're going to look at spot the trope. As a, as a writer of romance, we especially love our tropes. These are some of them up here. You know, we love enemies to lovers or fake dating or secret baby or marriage of convenience. And uh, a trope is basically a recurring theme or a motif in art that's a recognizable universal truth. It is a truth universally acknowledged as uh, Jane Austen would say. Um, and it's people that we recognize or tropes or scenarios that we all recognize as being, you know, present in our everyday lives. And so first up, every romance needs a hero and every man seems to brag about it. So this is some Pompe this is from the uh, gladiator barracks. This is scratched on the wall. Uh, it says, Basically, it translates as Celidus the Thracian makes all the girls moan. We've got a completely gratuitous picture here of uh, Kit Harrington uh, as a gladiator. I, I apologize for nothing. Um, there's another one here, which is uh, the worst humble brag ever, which was Floronius, soldier of the Seventh Legion was here. The women did not know of his presence. Only six women came to know too few for such a stallion. So, I mean, that's, that's guys bragging in the, in the locker room right there. Other tropes that we find, romance tropes in, you know, Pompeii and graffiti, we've got sweet romance. Uh, if anyone doesn't believe in Venus, they should gaze at my girlfriend. It's very sweet. Uh, Marcus loves Mendoza. Hector baby Makeda says hi. Um, I don't want to sell my husband not for all in the gold in the world. Those are quite sweet tropes. There's unrequited love. Um, Marcellus loves Pristina, but she doesn't care for him. Uh, Sarah, you're not being very nice, leaving you all alone. So these are all things we can really relate to. And this is exactly the same as 2000 years ago. People were having the same stories happening around them. And that was what they talked about and wrote about. This is a classic love triangle. Um, I've got Bridget Jones up here because there's, uh, think of the number of books and stories you've read with a classic love triangle recently. Um, this is basically two guys writing uh, one underneath the other. So Severus says, success as a weaver loves the innkeeper slave girl named Iris. She, however, does not love him. Still, he begs her to have pity on him. His rival wrote this, goodbye. And success is claps back with, envious one, why do you get in the way? Submit to a handsomer man and one who's been treated very wrongly and is good looking. And Severus, who clearly has a girl, uh, goes back and says, I've spoken, I've written all there is to say, you love Iris, but she does not love you. And so that's basically the theme of, think of all these things, True Blood, Hunger Games, Twilight, Bridget Jones, classic love triangle. We see this in romance all the time. I put my own spin on these. I think, I mean, I'm a big fan of the love-hate relationship, enemies to lovers trope. Um, there's a few bits of uh, graffiti, I think, lean that way. Um, Virgula to her friend Tertius, you are disgusting, you're a nasty boy. Yeah, it's an interesting one. She's bothered to write about him. She's still thinking about him, however much she says she hates him. Serena hates Isadorus. Does she know? And Stronius, Stronius knows nothing. And this made me laugh because for those who've watched Game of Thrones, there's uh, the very famous line, you know nothing, Jon Snow, which is, uh, that was kind of a nice little echo 2000 years later from, from that bit of graffiti. Uh, this one was another one, the cheating ex. Uh, Restitutus has deceived many girls. And uh, this one might be a secret baby trope, and Timotus got me pregnant. Uh-oh, that might be a crazy ex-girlfriend trope as well. Last up, we've got parted lovers. Um, Vivius Restituta slept here alone and missed his dying Urbana, which sounds sweet until you realise that was on the wall of a brothel. And I'm guessing Vivius Restituta's, uh, did he really sleep alone? 
did Obama ever have a chance to see that written on the wall? I doubt it. So lastly, and this is my absolute famous favorite one of all, um, we have all can relate to the idea of a bad Tinder date or a bad first date. This is written on the wall of the Basilica. The man I am having dinner with is a barbarian, which I don't know if that's literal, like literally is he a busy goth or does he just have really bad table manners? Um, that made me laugh because that's kind of the Pompeian equivalent. You can all imagine the girl going into the bathroom and calling her friend from the stall and saying, you've got to get me out of this date. It's a disaster. I'm having a nightmare. This guy's awful. So the themes are really similar. Um, and we didn't even invent text speak. Uh, the Romans had uh, abbreviations. They used to use SPD at the end of their letters for salutum plurimam dictit, which basically means send many greetings. So as modern as we like to think we are in our themes and our ideas of stories, nothing's really changed. Humans are the same. And so our stories are the same. So is it as obvious as story is fictional and history is facts? Unfortunately not. Um, in fact, in many European languages, it's been the same word, story and history. You can hear it, story, historia. Um, that's where the English word comes through from the Latin historia and the French histoire. And the problem is that that's basically been interchangeable for hundreds and hundreds of years, as there's no differentiation between something that's a true event and something that's made up. And so the actual meaning of history being true events is not recorded till about the 14th century, as in the idea of history being fact. And the idea of stories and narrative and fic fiction, um, just something just to entertain that never happened, um, is from about the 1500s. Um, interestingly, a euphemism for a lie, we say, oh, he's telling a story. That comes around in about the 1690s, so relatively late. So a bit problematic as well, because history isn't always facts. History lies all the time. And as an author, we talk about point of view. And we should always remember that history is written by the winners. Um, it's always a biased account. Um, everyone's trying to be the hero of their own story and they never make themselves look bad. So you're always getting maybe distorted facts or certainly a fact omitted that support whichever argument they want to say. So you could say all history is in fact fiction. Um, what I've got here is a picture of Richard III um, we tend to think of him as written by Shakespeare, which is this cruel hunchback man who, you know, murdered his nephews, the princes in the tower. That was purely written to flatter Shakespeare's patron, which was Elizabeth I. And if you know your history, uh, her grandfather was, in fact, the person who beat uh, Richard III at the Battle of Bosworth. Um, he was the last of the old Plantagenet dynasty and her grandfather, um, Richard, uh, sorry, her grandfather, um, Henry Tudor was basically the, um, the first of the Tudor dynasty. And so by making the, the enemy out to be really terrible, kind of, kind of legitimizes their claim to the throne. So obviously everyone has their own agenda when they're talking about historical facts. So how do my two worlds, auctioneering and writing, collide? Well, sometimes they're completely opposite. Writing a catalogue description is the opposite of writing a romance novel in the sense that uh, there's no emotive language at all. Catalogue is just the facts. We say you describe the lot, the whole lot, and nothing but the lot. So I can't say it's a beautiful, a beautiful table or a fantastic, you know, really unusual 17th century ring. Um, it is just, I describe what it is. Um, writing romance is the complete opposite of that. We want the emotion. We want all our senses to be, you know, fired up. We want the opinions of the point of view character to know what they're thinking. We want to be in their head, see what they see, what they see, touch what they touch, smell it. That's what makes it a great um, immersive experience for us. But stories are powerful things, not just obviously in the in the books that we write, but also when it comes to selling things. And so the story behind something in auctioneering terms is called provenance. It's the history behind it. And that adds value. Um, obviously, we've sold lots of items at auction. Uh, this is a classic, and it just shows, um, this is not one I sold, but this came up for auction fairly recently. Uh, this is a ring. And if this came into my auction house, I would look at it and say, OK, it's a fairly standard you and me ring. It's got a pear shaped, about one carat diamond. It's got a similar size sapphire it's got a small amount of gold value for the for the gold and about a thousand dollars a carat maybe for the for the 
um, diamond, a bit less for the sapphire. So it's about a thousand or a couple of thousand dollars for the ring. So far, so good. But what if I told you that it's the engagement ring Napoleon Bonaparte gave to his first wife, Josephine? Do you think that will change the value? I can't see any of you, I'm assuming you're all going, duh, yeah. So in 2013, uh, the French uh, auction house, Ozanat, got to sell this and they had a lot of background information that proved that this was the ring, that it had you know, been passed through a family, that this was the actual ring. And they put a value on it, obviously for the catalog you have to, and they said, they were a little bit coy. They said, we based our estimate in our catalog on the actual market value of the ring, minus the Napoleon and Josephine provenance. It's not our job to tell bidders how much they should pay for the historical premium. Now they're being a bit naughty there because actually, as I've said, it was about a $2,000 value for a ring with no provenance at all. They did a 10X, they estimated it at 20 to $30,000. So they had obviously put some kind of value on the ring, but it was one of those ones where nobody knows what the heck's gonna happen. What does it sell for? Just under a million dollars, 949,000 and plus the buyer's commission on top of that. So the buyer actually paid $1.18 million for a ring that without that story would have been worth about 1,500 to $2,000. So clearly story is a valuable thing. So how do authors like myself use history to add value and depth to our stories? There's lots of uh, documented cases and George R. R. Martin is one of the most outspoken on this about how he's basically written the English Wars of Roses with dragons. That's his Game of Thrones you know, series. And he very much says that his plots are based on real history. So his ice wall is based on Hadrian's Wall, which is the real old border between England and Scotland. And this is a quote directly from him. He said, certainly the wall comes from Hadrian's Wall, which I saw while visiting Scotland. I stood on Hadrian's wall and tried to imagine what it would be like to be a Roman soldier sent here from Italy or Antioch, to stand here, to gaze off into the distance, not knowing what might emerge from the forest. Of course, fantasy is the stuff of bright colors and being larger than real life. So my wall is bigger and considerably longer and more magical. And of course, what lies beyond it has to be more than just Scots. So what's interesting there is, he's saying exactly what I said at the beginning, he says here, I stood on Hadrian Wall and tried to imagine what it would be like to be a Roman soldier. And it's going back to that really basic human need of empathy, of being able to put yourself in someone else's place and have an adventure through their eyes, but all the while being safe and not having to deal with the undead and dragons and Cersei Lannister. He says the Red Wedding, that's inspired by two very real events in historical, uh, in Scottish history, the Black Dinner and the Glencoe Massacre. I won't read them all out here, but basically the Black Dinner was, a, they're both classic cases of where there was an ancient kind of agreement that you couldn't harm somebody who was under the protection of your hospitality. And both these cases, um, enemies were invited in under the guise of friendship and were then basically um, treacherously murdered, I suppose. And everyone cried foul, you know, this is against all the laws of hospitality. Um, despite the fact that, you know, wars shouldn't have any rules at all, obviously. Um, so yes, this is the Glencoe Massacre and the Black Dinner, um, which Martin says very obviously those are directly stolen from history. And yet so many people were shocked, sh appalled by this in the actual um, shows when they came out and you see reaction videos of people being amazed and every historian that ever ever read read any account of history was watching that you know just knowing what was going to happen and praying it wasn't but it did. Uh, another one is Tolkien, J.R.R. Tolkien uh, is known to have said that the riders of Rohan from the Lord of the Rings were based on the Anglo-Saxons if they'd had access to a huge number of horses. So it's the author's job is to play this what if game you know you take something and you maybe twist the historical narrative or you think okay what if we merge these two together and that's what i do so i've used really lots of real historical events as plot points i'm going to describe a few of them i don't know if anyone's read any of these books of mine um, or not but when i research you end up going down the weirdest historical rabbit holes and you find the most amazing facts that you think that's so ridiculous it's got to go in a book or if i wrote that nobody would believe it because it's so outlandish so this first book of mine this is still a heart um i stumbled on the real life um account of Henri Letude, who was a french chap who was imprisoned for trying to be a hero he sent 
a poison, uh, some poison powder to Marie Antoinette and then pretended to, you know, find out about the plot. Um, but obviously they found out that it was him that had sent it. And so he was sent to the Bastille and then later the prison of Vincennes near Paris. And luckily he wrote an account of exactly how he escaped, which is this book here. And I found it. Here he is, an illustration of his escaping with a rope ladder he made. And I just thought that was absolutely fantastic, the idea that this guy had escaped from not one but two prisons and told us how he did it. So here he is. Uh, I love the fact that he's got you know, his ladder and he's pointing this is the Bastille. This is the Chateau of Vincennes, which he escaped from. Uh, this would have been a moat filled with water. And I just thought that was absolutely fantastic. And in fact, the Chateau still has, this is the actual rope ladder that he made out of taking all his blankets apart and re-waving it, weaving it into rope and stealing legs off chairs and stuff over the years to actually make this rope ladder to escape. And I played the what if game. I like people to have a happy ending. So this little chap here is the, um, the Dauphin of France. He was the son of uh, Louis XIV and Marie Antoinette. He was Louis Charles de Bourbon. And in reality, he was imprisoned also in the Tour prison and he probably died in prison aged about 10 or 11 um, but weird conspiracy theories I read a few that thought he might have been smuggled out people like a happy ending and I thought no I'm going to give him the happy ending so what if he was rescued from prison by my hero and heroine in my book in the same way that uh, let you escape because clearly it was possible it was unlikely but it was possible to escape so that was the basic plot I did a couple of real historical facts and I put them into this um, made up setting and I gave a happy ever after to my hero and heroine and a little boy another one I used was uh, for this cell of mine that is I stumbled upon a real plot to rescue Napoleon from exile by submarine now I had never heard of submarines in 1816. I thought this was the most ridiculous thing I'd ever heard. And the more I read, the more I was amazed. Um, I came across an account of this guy here who is a complete scoundrel called uh, Tom Johnson, who claimed he was offered the sum of 40,000 pounds by the French to rescue Napoleon by submarine. And it turns out that he said he'd worked with an American inventor called Robert Fulton. And so I dug into Fulton and it turns out that yes, indeed, there were Regency submarines. Um, this chap, Robert Fulton, who went on to be very famous for um, the first commercial steamships, was this incredible inventor. And he worked for the French uh, when he was when they were fighting the English. And then he defected to the English because the French wouldn't pay him. And he had designed a working submarine by 1816, which I thought was fantastic. So my history brain is thinking this is a great thing that I didn't know about. And maybe other people would be interested. But also my romance brain is thinking that submarines look at that. It's tiny, there's hardly room for two people to squish together and it'll be really dark and sweaty. And so my romance brain is trying to mush my hero and the heroine into a dark enclosed space. So everything came together. The plot of that book was hero and heroine, he's a spy, she owns a ship, a shipping business. They are trying to stop this submarine from leaving, leaving London and stop Napoleon being rescued. We talked about Vincennes when I was uh, researching Latude history of the uh, Chateau of Vincennes. And it turns out that it was not only a prison, it was also a place where Napoleon set up a counterfeiting operation, which again, I thought was fantastic. Um, there is a lot of documentary evidence and letters that survived from Napoleon that show that he employed a team of forgers on a massive scale to print fake currency to ruin his enemies. So he paid his own soldiers in Russia with fake money, fake French assignats, which is this up here. This is, a, this is an actual fake that was printed at the time. And he sent large quantities of fake Austrian money into Austria to try and flood their market and destabilize the economy. Um, this obviously put him in a problematic position a bit later. His second wife was Austrian. She was the Archduchess Mary Louise, and she made him issue a public ban and publicly say that it was illegal to counterfeit money against her country. Uh, obviously, it was a bit late by then. Um, but I just thought, again, this was such an interesting idea. This story, Counterfeit Heart, the heroine is one of those counterfeiters. And I did the what if of what happens. You know, Napoleon is exiled to St. Helena. This counterfeiting operation is left, all this money. And so the opening of this book opens with her burning most of the money, but she can't resist taking a couple of suitcases 
as if you've won the lottery, she's going to run to England and escape with a heck of a lot of money. And that's the, that's the opening scene. Of course, she runs into our spy hero who is going to stop her from flooding the English market with all these fakes. But it, I just thought it was such a great starting point for a, a story. This is one of my favorites. Um, Cachanel is based on the theft of the French crown jewels. So just after the revolution, the French crown jewels were confiscated from the king and queen and they were put in the, um, in the Louvre, which at the time was like a prison and a general administrative offices. And they were stolen over the course. They were very badly guarded. Some think it was an inside job, but basically thousands and thousands of jewels were stolen, um, including this. This is a really famous, it's called the French Blue. Here it is as it was mounted in, uh, this is a great big uh, order of the Golden Fleece, which was worn in lots of official paintings by the Kings of France. This was this enormous 69 carat blue diamond, incredibly rare, um, and it was stolen. And along with a whole bunch of other things, this was a pink diamond called the Hortensia, named after uh, Napoleon's stepdaughter. This is the Regent diamond, which is 140 carats. That's enormous, 140 carat diamond and the Sancy, which is a pale yellow diamond. They were all stolen and they disappeared. And some of them turned up very quickly. The Regent and the Hortensia only were hidden in somebody's attic and were found after a few months of searching. Um, and they eventually found their way back to the Louvre. The Sancy disappeared until 1828 and uh, was sold to a Russian prince who then uh, basically sold it to a jeweler and it was bought by William Waldorf Astor and is now in the Louvre. And I was in the Louvre uh, a couple of months ago and I went to see them and here is the Sancy, the Hortensia and the Regent sitting in the, the Louvre. It was kind of nice to see them, but it got me thinking what happened to the French blue? And in fact, what happened to all those other diamonds? It wasn't just these main ones that were, were lost. Pretty much everything was lost and the fact is you can't really destroy diamonds or gemstones you can't you know they're the strongest things on earth you can melt down the gold and the silver and the crowns but the, the diamonds have got to be somewhere and the french blue was an interesting one because i tried to track it down and um napoleon also tried to track it down because he knew that it was pretty shameful for france not to have any crown jewels so he offered lots of rewards and information for it and French law, though, has a statute of limitations, which means that after 20 years on stolen property, if nobody can be charged with a crime. So it's no coincidence that two days after the statute of limitations expired, which is in 1812, after the theft, um, two days, uh, a, a 45 carat deep blue diamond showed up in a London jewelers with a guy called Jean Francillon. Uh, and he sold it to a guy called uh, Daniel Eliasson. Now, pretty much everyone at the time knew that this had to have been the French blue. There was no other great big blue diamond in the world known, um, but there's pretty murky. There was some documentation with it. He claimed he was the owner and um, nobody really knew what had happened to it until in 1830, this stone was bought. It turned into the Hope Diamond. Um, Philip Hope, a banker bought this blue, this shape blue diamond, which is now in, is known as the Hope Diamond. Um, it went through the family, it went to Cartier, it went to Harry Winston, and it finally is in the Smithsonian. And recently, within the last couple of years, they have definitely proved with, you know, computer technology that this is the uh, Hope Diamond and this outside shape is the original uh, Bleu de France or French blue, which is how it was cut down and how it exactly fits in. So there's pretty much no doubt that the Bleu de France ended up as a Hope Diamond. But again, that plot of the uh, Cachanel is based on what happened to all those other jewels. They're out there somewhere. You know, someone has one in an attic and I just like the idea of my heroine in that book is a thief and she is basically trying to steal back all these diamonds that have been stolen. So that's where the story starts from that. And the hero obviously is trying to catch this thief who's stealing all these diamonds from the Prince Regent and various aristocracy in England who've ended up with them. And it's not just real historical events that can spark ideas, items, historical things can spark ideas as well. So this I have seen quite a few times in my value in life is called Kintzkroy. 
It's a Japanese art where they basically repair with gold something that has been broken. And the idea is that it is more beautiful for having been broken than if it had just stayed as the object, however old and valuable that original object was, because somebody has cared enough for this item to, to mend it. And so there's this kind of really nice feeling. And I thought that was a great theme to have running through this book, Raven's Heart, where my heroine is scarred. She's got a scar on her face. And the idea that the hero loves her more for being broken and mended and uh, admires her more because of it. So that's an idea of, you know, using a historical, I suppose, an item to inspire a plot. So I hope you've stayed with me. That is a really whistle-stop tour in half an hour through history and story. Um, I hope that's got you thinking about stories and the history that you come across every day. I uh, hope it's got you thinking about tropes and the kind of stories that you like to listen to. We tend to repeat and like the themes and watch shows and read books that have those favorite tropes and themes in them. So I know that I'm a sucker for, you know, uh, a good, redemption story of a villain or something like that. I love enemies to lovers romance. In fact, all my favorite things seem to have those kind of sparring um, couples like, I don't know, uh, Han and Leia in, or in Star Wars or, um, you know, let's say enemies who, who end up together. Um, so what are your favorite tropes and universal themes? We've seen them running all through history from Pompeii onwards. Um, and that's it, any questions? I'd love to answer some questions, so. Keep on coming. <laughs> oh, that was amazing. I've been seeing in, in the chat and everything that people are fascinated with everything you're saying. Hey, do you want to turn your um, shared screen off and then we can just uh, chat with and uh, answer questions? Yes, how do I do that? I'm not technical in any oh. way. <laughs> uh, just uh, up at the... Hang on a minute. I'll Down take care of it. Go. I got it. Thank you, there we go. There we go. Okay, great. So um, first question from Mary Lynn, what are those root stories that are thousands of years older than the fairy tales that we know well? Well, so that's going back to like the legend of Gilgamesh. And these are kind of the epic poems that that's how it started out. Um, and they're basically adventure stories. They're, they're you know, they, they have everything. That has him going into the, after, um, the underworld effectively. It's a bit like you get um, the huge, sort of Greek and Roman epics as well, like all those adventures like the Iliad and the Odyssey and all these great big adventures where our heroes go and meet these different people and have all these different things happen to them. And we kind of understand that that can't really have happened, but we still love all those tropes. I mean, the Iliad and the Odyssey have all of those, you know, you meet weird people. It's got fantasy, it's got gods and goddesses who are, you know, fantastically human they're, they're jealous and they are petty and they squabble and they argue and they marry each other and they have affairs and I mean it's brilliantly mixed up and that's why it's so fascinating today is because we're still obsessed with these things you know the old the gods in those are the Kardashians of their day you know Pompeii graffiti is the social media people are just literally writing it on the wall instead of putting it in their phone so yeah human psyche however much we want to think we're really evolved we're not that different and it's why those kind of universal fantasies appeal still is that we want the safe escape to explore those ideas and then come back and still be in our armchair safe and sound with a cup of tea i have to say that i'm slightly horrified that the kardashians are the current gods and goddesses yeah. are considered <laughs> yeah maybe they're kind of nymphs i don't know it's okay um, but I mean, you're right, like they are the like bigger than life kind of characters of our, our current, you know, social media. Yeah, I mean, with the, I mean, pick up any news, you know, article, it's talking about, I suppose, the gods and goddesses are the film stars and the, you know, the NFL stars, they're all the people at the edges of life, they are the really super wealthy or the super ridiculous or the super talented, they're the ones we want to see. And we we like to see them fail as much as we like to see them win. In fact, we, we kind of prefer it. We One of the most popular features on the People magazine is apparently that, you know, celebs are just like us and here's them doing the shopping. And that's yeah, like, yeah. since they did that, their circulation has been through the roof. So yeah, the, the themes are all the same, I think. And that's why we have these recurring tropes in literature is we're all the same, you know. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, yes, British royalty. Hollywood movie says, yeah. 
So Elizabeth asks, um, thank you for the quotations from the Pompeii, that was fascinating. Is there a book I might read to learn more about those? Yes, I, I should have put some links because they're in my notes underneath, but you guys can't see that. Um, I can post a few links. There's a couple of really good books, um, and but they're all from slightly different, like I pulled out just the ones from with a kind of romance tropey list. But in fact, it's like, these are almost like trip advisor. It's most of them are like, don't sleep in this, in the beds are terrible or, you know, for, for a lot of it's like, you know, here you can have a really great, you know, kebab or whatever it is. I mean, it's really funny, but they're, they're written on the walls. So yeah, there are a couple of books. I mean, uh, if you search online, you can find quite a few articles on it. That's where I got most of those, those from. If you want, you can send me a couple of links later and I can include it in my recap to everybody. Yeah, yeah, cool. Okay. Um, Megan says, do you ever take current stories from the present and adapt them for your historical romances? Ooh, yes, <laughs> sometimes. In fact, I'm doing a really cool and I'm just about to write a novella, which is uh, for an anthology later in the year, Christmas anthology, and it's called Desert Island Duke. And it's basically, I'm going to shipwreck my hero and heroine. And it's going to be like Naked and Afraid meets Love Island meets, you know, <laughs> all of those survivor. I just think it's brilliant when you just throw people onto this island and make them do stuff. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's, I guess, a case of, yeah, turning a real modern thing into a historical thing. Mm -hmm. Um, Elizabeth asks, do you visit museums and get a chance to talk to curators to learn more? Sometimes I've done, uh, I get to do sometimes in England, I would do behind the scenes and go to the archives and get to see and value the stuff they have in their, in their collections that needs to do on a regular basis. And what's tragic is how little as the public we get to see. I mean, the British Museum, they have something like 80% of their collection is never on show that's purely in the basements and that hurts me because I think all art is public and it should be on show and if you bothered stealing it from everywhere in the world and that's a completely different thing of you know should we return the Parthenon models you know um yes probably by the way um you know at least it should be on show so that it's available for the most people to see and so it breaks my heart the number of amazing art paintings especially which are my love i it hurts me how few are actually available i think they should at least send them out on on traveling exhibitions for people to see so yeah i get to see some pretty cool stuff oh there's my crazy dog there's monty hi mont hello <laughs> he's there like a show dog <laughs> he's, yeah, he's, he's, the, the toy pig is bigger than him, but he's his favorite, so. <laughs> That's funny. So Megan asks, um, and I have the same question, have you ever used a story from a piece that you encounter in your auction house in one of your stories? Yes, all the, t all the time. I did one purely based on a uh, portrait miniature that came in, which was a, a really handsome, a portrait miniature is a really tiny little picture on ivory. And the people who bought it in didn't know anything about it. It was not they didn't think it was a relative and I thought it was tragic that they were selling it but it was a really good looking guy in a soldier's uniform and that just instantly got me thinking, well who is he where's he been you know and there was a few little inscriptions on the back and so he sort of turned into a couple of my hero you know Napoleonic soldier heroes I had him in the back of my mind because he was a good looking chap <laughs> um, and yeah all the time like it's the, the stories that people come out with are amazing and I you just think wow that's that's so cool Mm -hmm. So, I know your first book was sort of a medieval, um, Italian uh, yeah, yeah, because <laughs> yeah, that's the one I, I, I started out with you with that one. And I was, I did wonder, because of your history with the auction house, did you pull in aspects of things you would learn there to inform your, that book? Yeah, I, I suppose all of my book, in the sense that, obviously, I have seen a ridiculous amount of things, certainly from the Regency period. There everywhere they come in literally on a daily basis so I mean I know when I'm describing a Regency room I know what the dress feels like and I know what the you know the teacup was like and I know the furniture and the carriages and everything so I know the manager the problem is you don't you want to give a sprinkle of that detail without bogging people down in I mean I could describe the furniture in the room of the Duke's mm -hmm. thing all day nobody wants to know that it's you know banded tulip wood they just want to see him with the heroine on the desk kissing mm -hmm. so you have to put a little bit of that historical flavor, but not too much. 
Um, mm -hmm. But I think it helps knowing in my head, I've got a feel of what it, it's like. And like with the Italian, you know, it helps if you've been to these places. So I had been to Roman palaces and things like that and, and seen a lot of that era stuff. So it was kind of nice to at least have it in the back of your mind when you're when you're writing here. Mm -hmm. Were you, um, I guess I should say, how did you feel about that Banksy thing where they shredded it, where it got shredded? It was genius, by the way. I mean, it was it was news before. I mean, that man is an absolute genius for self promotion, if nothing else, right? And the irony is that's a bit like the idea of the value of art. Like, how on earth do you value something that is priceless at the same? Why is priceless not the same as worthless? It's worth whatever anyone will pay. Like that ring. If you like, if you had the ring and it was just a ring, somebody would have paid a thousand dollars for it. And yet, this magical fairy dust that associates with history and things we think adds this value and so when the Mona Lisa was stolen um, I think it was in the 50s um, more people went to see the gap on the wall where they left it than had gone to see it in the previous 10 years which is ridiculous because they didn't go and see the art so I think that Banksy thing is the same type of thing it's like it was very clever and he's it's making a good point on the disposability of art because he's known for these very quick you know spray painted stuff that don't take long at all and yet it was worth something complete but it's worth even more now it's been shredded and he had that shock value where he did it live while it was being or just after it had been auctioned yeah. which is even better because someone thought they'd got this original and then it literally was shredded and so is it worth more or less it was i think that was a piece of genius um <laughs> Would I want to own a Banksy? Not particularly. I, I wouldn't want it on my wall, but I think it's a really, really clever bit of art mm -hmm. and, and performance art as much as visual art. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a couple more stories of like th something that was at the auction house and once you found the story, you, re you realized it was more valuable or, or the value was different? Because the story yeah. about Napoleon's ring was just so amazing. Yeah, I mean, I've had, I've sold things that were cool, you know, so I sold a uh, uh, bizarrely someone bought in a half smoked cigar that Winston Churchill had smoked which is a very odd thing to sell but and the first thing is like okay prove it prove this solid iron clad provenance that isn't just a stub you've picked up last week from a club um, and it, it turned out that this man's father had been in the war that had met Churchill and physically had a meeting and this was actually a picture of them in the meeting together with him having a cigarette and he said he ordered a cigar he put it down, the grand or the father picked it up thinking this is a great souvenir, kept it in a box, took it home, wrote about it. So, I mean, it had a pretty good, but again, it's, it's a half smoked cigar. So, I mean, it was one of those ones, I think it made a few hundred dollars, I mean, or pounds, but it wasn't a huge amount of money. Um, we also had a collector who only buys desks that famous people have written at which is a very, very specific thing to collect. And thank God for crazy millionaires because they make my life a lot better. But we happened to sell a desk that used to belong to the writer Elizabeth Barrett Browning. Um, and this guy literally owns Napoleon's desk. He owns Wellington's desk. He owns every, it's ridiculous. So, and there's very few people when a desk comes up that you think, who's gonna want this? Oh, I know, the one guy in the world that wants desks from famous people. So, so long as you could get the word out that this is Elizabeth Barrett Browning's desk and you can prove it, that, that sold, I can't remember exactly how much it sold, but we sold that and that sold pretty well. I mean, obviously, if he's the only person bidding for it, he could get it for a hundred dollars, right? There was quite a bit of interest from like the museum that has her stuff. And so there was, there was a good lot of counter bidding. But Again, this this very just of the story behind it, it's just a desk, right? It's just wood put together just the same way as a painting is just some paint and a bit of wood and canvas. But the difference between one painted by somebody and somebody else is very a lot different. Mm -hmm. What about uh, we didn't really get into like your history, like how did you get into being an auctioneer? I think you had I read somewhere that this is a family auction house. Yeah, so when I was growing up, my parents had, they were both painters, fine artists, um, but they also had an antique shop. So I spent my whole life living in an antique shop or above an antique shop and, and working in it and picking up information by osmosis. Um, but I did not want anything to do with that when I left Sky. I did English and French and history uh, and, and degrees in, in English Lit. Um, and so I thought I wanted to go into publishing, ironically. <laughs> 
kind of like writing. So I was messing about doing some work. I worked for Cosmopolitan magazine for a while. Mm -hmm. And I worked for, who are now my publishers, I worked for Macmillan for a while. Um, but then I decided to go back. He said he was going to open an auction house instead of the sell, uh, instead of the, the shop. And he said, I'll oh, come back and you know, I'll, I, I'll do the paintings and the furniture and you just can do everything else. And idiot me is not realizing that's 90% of the work. Um, uh, when on some crash courses, you have to do some legal, you know, stuff to actually physically auction it to make sure I'm complying to the laws and I know all the rules about it. I did a lot of very quick courses in the space of a year or two where I, you know, learned about ceramics and coins and banknotes and all these, you know, gemstones. But a lot of it was working on the job. I mean, we started in 2001 and then I had the next 12 years literally seeing tens of thousands of items. And at the start, you don't know what anything is and you research everything. And by the end, you know what everything is and you get really excited when something comes in that you don't know what it is because that's like I have never seen one of those what is that and then you kind of go into this research like coma which is I get super excited by that. Mm -hmm. did, did any particular um, kind of object become sort of your favorite or the thing that you looked for? Oh uh, so much I think it's nice to always see the best of whatever the thing is. So it doesn't, it's not necessarily the most valuable thing. It's just, if you get like the best example of, you know, Regency, you know, embroidery or, you know, a, a little portrait miniature, or you get the best, you know, piece of furniture that with the quality, it's, it's kind of nice to see like, we, I, I would collect antiquities myself. Uh, I love, and they're not expensive. People think it, because it's really old, it therefore means expensive, but it's not, it's to do with rarity value. Um, so I would buy Italian, or no, you know, I buy Egyptian stuff, I buy, you know, Renaissance stuff, but not not very much money. You know, you can get an Italian a little Shabti figurine, which is like a tiny little turquoise finance thing that goes in a, in a tomb. They're a couple of hundred dollars. I mean, it's not a huge amount of money to have something that's 3000 years old in your house. Roman oil lamps are about fifty dollars. You know, it's not much. Not the kind you find like on the street of Rome, but like in a real place. <laughs> uh, proper old ones, proper old ones. And um, yeah, you, and there's lots of fakes and forgeries out there. I could do a whole a whole thing on fakes and forgeries as well, um, especially Chinese ceramics. I would never trust. Uh, however much I see, I would never trust uh, uh, my own eyes with a, a Ming vase because there's so many fakes and they're so good. Oh, wow. Yeah, second and third opinions on stuff like that. So um, can you talk a little bit about provenance? Like how does your auction house um, find, you know, make sure things are authentic? Because of course you just said that things can be fake and people are better, getting better and better at making fakes. Yeah, and obviously it's the high value items that are the most fake, basically. People mm -hmm. don't, if it's a kind of mid-range item, people just don't bother. Um, so usually if something really good comes in, we start on that whole prove to me that it's real you know prove that it's not fake so you check off you know is it like we had a painting or a, a drawing coming um which the the guy said it was by Gainsborough who we all know is a very famous British thing and it was it was a really nice drawing on paper charcoal and pencil and heightened and like chalk and um look right and so we we do this checklist of like is it on the right paper you know do we know he did this subject and so I did loads of research on this trying to prove that it was right and I traced it back to it being a sketch from a known portrait that is a painting by him that is in London and I took that I took it down to uh, another scholar who actually just deals in you know games with paint, portraits and paintings and I got it double checked um, and it turned out that it was partly by uh, Gainsborough and partly by his nephew, who's a guy called Gainsborough DuPont, who inherited all of Gainsborough's studio after Gainsborough died, and also was an artist and sometimes kind of added bits to, and sort of slowly sold off these things to kind of finance his life. And so what we found was, because when you look at it, the, the head was fantastic, the head of this person, and it was a guy sitting in a chair and a portrait, quite quickly done but the head was fantastic but the kind of there was something weird about the hands they were a bit chunky and they weren't that great and so that's why we were kind of trying to figure out and it turned out that yeah I think the the nephew had probably tried to finish off the hands and done a worse job of it so it was this weird thing where it turned out to be like a half a Gainsborough and a half a Gainsborough DuPont which kind of made it more interesting so we ended up selling that for several thousand pounds just for this tiny drawing mm -hmm. um, but it was nice because it ended up I think with next to it was a study for a main painting a portrait of a guy so it's kind of nice to see that as a 
a sort of side note to the main painting that's where it ended up so yeah that was a case where I followed it I physically took it padlocked to me on a on a train down to London to this specialist and got it double checked so it's a bit of like detective work on a lot of stuff and some stuff does turn out to be fake you know we've, we've had ones where we really thought we had one that we absolutely thought was right and then right at the last minute we pulled it because we didn't think it was right and we had lots of people question it so some things don't work out but uh, sometimes they do we've sold some pretty cool stuff over the years absolutely it sounds amazing um megan says she hasn't read your books yet but she's gonna and she was wondering if you would go to other time periods to explore the stories or are you doing mostly regency because that's what the time you know the most about it's an interesting one because obviously i started not knowing anything about what the market and what traditional publishers wanted i wrote what i wanted to read uh, and what i enjoyed reading which was um Italian Renaissance I mentioned to, earlier to, to Mina that I liked you know Julie Garwood's medievals and I'd read um, Laura Kinsale's fantastic medievals and um, I couldn't find that many so I that's why I wrote one I, I wrote that because I was interested in that period but then when it came to try and get an actual contract where I thought okay I'll do this professionally uh, traditional publishers very much know that they can sell Regency so they really like authors when they pitch a series to pitch them a Regency which is I understand why they do that because it's a known quantity but at the same time if you're not offering any other time periods you don't know whether they'll sell or not because no one's got the choice if you're only offering regency of course all your sales are regency so it's an interesting one and i i'm sort of hybrid in that i'm really lucky to have a traditional contract but i also do like passion projects of my own in between which is exactly that i've done because i get bored with straight regency so that first series I wrote of um, The Secrets and Spies was the first one's based in France. It's a prison freight one. The second one's in Spain with the code breakers. Um, I've done Promise of a Kiss. It's an Egypt Regency set novella. So Desert Island Duke, which is a, the crazy one that's coming up, is going to be, I don't even know, that's off, somewhere in the Indian Ocean on the Seychelles or somewhere tropical. So I, you can have a bit of fun with it. I would love to do like a Pompeii, Rome, glad. I mean, think of it, gladiators. Who doesn't love a gladiator? The potential I that. <laughs> gold dugger is excellent. Um, so yeah, and there's all these amazing times and places in the world. Like, why are we so fixated on the eight to 10 years of English Regency? It's pretty boring when you think about it. Um, much as I love Regency, I mean, there is a certain magic to that. And I think that's a sweet spot between readers. They're far enough away for it to be you know, fantasy, but at the same time, the people are accessible enough in that the clothes aren't so weird and the, the language isn't so odd that they can't really relate to it. So I don't know, I, I, I quite like doing crazy things. I might even do some historical paranormals. I think that would be really cool as well. So watch <laughs> this space. I'm never gonna say never because I might just, who knows. I'm on that. <laughs> Um, so Elizabeth says, Kate, my dad, who was a real archaeologist, collected ancient oil lamp. We six kids each inherited seven Roman and Byzantine lamps. Now you have me wondering if they are authentic. How could I find out who would be the people to consult here in the US? Oh my goodness. Well, the good news is they probably are in the sense that if I guess if you went to Rome today and there were thousands of them on the street and they're probably not all legit. But I guess, you know, back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, there were still tons of them kicking around i mean prices have gone up a lot recently but as i said when i was you know you could literally pick them up for a few hundred dollars so they probably are fine because there are lots and lots of them around um and they're not rare enough that they are subject to like export restrictions so it's not like you're trading something that probably shouldn't have been smuggled out of a country like something really like a sarcophagus that you probably shouldn't be buying. um so i think they're probably okay i mean there will be, I guess, your local museum, and there's plenty of museums you could probably take them to. Um, mm -hmm. There's not huge amounts of um, tests you can do on the physical material that aren't quite destructive, like you actually have to shave a bit off if you really want to check that it's 3,000 old porcelain. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think you're probably safe. If your dad was an archaeologist, I mean, that's my dream job in a different life i would totally be indiana jones or indiana jane and marion Rave would go off and have an adventure right that would be so cool um so they're probably good but yeah you can take them to maybe an auction house if you have a like if you have a big city would, would have it excellent i mean i feel it seems like to me like you could write almost anything 
if you know a little bit of history. Like not only like the actual objects, but the story around the objects, the the story around um, collecting objects, stealing objects. I mean, it's just really like fascinating. There are so many. So I I seem to have a theme in my books, which is things that I like lost and found and recovered because that's my interest is I love to read stories about art that's been found I one day I dream in my lifetime they will find the amber room for example that was stolen from the Ekaterinburg palace uh, by the Nazis it's probably got blown up in a blitz in in a castle in Jerry but I still hope that it's survived somewhere in some mine shaft in Poland in a train you know somewhere um, and there's also there's others there's a Caravaggio a very famous painting by Caravaggio that is probably been destroyed but it's, I just think somehow that, that happy ever after in me is like that's just under somebody's grandma's bed <laughs> they've had it on the back of their wall not knowing what it is it's, it's been used as the back of a canvas for something else so all of those things they, they seem to be themes in my stories I've done exactly that like you know what's real and what's fake for counterfeit as I've done I've done thieves you know people who steal stuff and it's it's bad things for good reasons as well. There's kind of lots of morally great areas in that whole stolen art, you know, thing. It's like, if you steal something that's already been stolen, is it really stealing because it didn't belong to the person in the first place? So I like all those kind of conflict questions that you can get for your characters by dealing with those, those gray areas. Well, this has been amazingly interesting as I expected it would be. Thank you, Kate, so much for all of your insight and humor and, knowledge which you've shared with us and um like i said i was seeing in the chat earlier people were just really fascinated by i, know, I went so fast i probably i mean thank you for everyone for staying with me because that was i went straight through in half an hour in all of those slides and like you know i could quite happily have done half an hour on every single slide each one of those was a side shoot of various things that we could have delved into but um that was so cool i hope it wasn't too much because my husband i had 50 slides and my husband was like you need 25 slides max for a presentation i'm like but there's so much to talk about so, i know we'll have yeah. to do a uh, part two sometime take two yeah i mean yeah i could oh, quite Marilyn agrees with yeah. me <laughs> um I so i will send out links and uh, resources and the video link probably tomorrow um so you'll be once it's uploaded to our youtube channel i send out a recap after all of our programs so Kate, you're gonna send me some of those links and I'll, um, I'll share them with everybody who, who came. And um, I, like I said, thank you so much. Thank you for everybody for being here and um, listening and, and just your wonderful questions. They were really um, made the conversation so much more interesting, I think too. So I, know, I wish we were in person then we could all stay and have a gin and tonic and a glass of wine and I'll start chatting about it. <laughs> Kate, soon, Kate, we'll Kate, I'm still on the clock here. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I'm I'm a stumble from my kitchen, so I, I'm gonna probably celebrate the fact that this is done now. Okay. Yes, you did not have dinner. So, but yes, uh, anytime you are in the area, you're welcome to come over, and we'll have a we'll have you can have a gin and tonic, and I will have an orange juice. So, okay. um, very responsible. Thank you. <laughs> and everybody here is invited. Um, yeah. So have a wonderful night, and I will talk to you soon. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming. Bye, everyone.